And Sister Carol, would you pray, please? Yes, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, please. <clears throat> While you're turning there, I just want to give God thanks to be here. This time last year, it was a different story. I got sick with COVID here, and I got stuck here for about a month. Went home and continued to suffer. So from last August to this August, it has been a year of suffering for me. But praise God, I'm here. And I'm thankful, and quite frankly, I'm feeling pretty good. So I give God thanks for what he has done. He gets all the glory. It's been a rough ride, but the Lord has helped us to hang on, and we're still here to tell it. So without any further ado, we'll get into the word. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 from Revelation chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches." So we would like for you to have an ear to hear today because I'm talking to the church. And we're looking to God to help us in a way that uh, will be meaningful. Now the scripture here in verse 1, the latter part of that says, speaking to this particular church of the, church, uh, of the seven churches of Asia, and I'm not here to try to prove points about what age we're in and this and that. Any message that you can pull from Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is relevant to our day. And uh, we can find something in there for all of us. But this is what God has given me for this moment, and so we will proceed accordingly. So take what is yours, take it personally, and what isn't, just thank God you're not there. And we'll see how the name comes, uh, I mean, how the word comes and finds us, everyone. But the latter part of verse number 1 says, you have a name to live, but you are dead. The question is, is that relevant to us today? Are there those in what calls itself the church of God who are the church of God by name but has no life? Now, anytime we talk about things like this, it's always the other person. It's not us, it's them. It's they. It's those over there. Today, I'd like for you to bring it home. Or let Lord bring it home to all of us. Examine ourselves. If it's not you, then glory be to God. If it is, I, wherever you're found today, there's room for improvement. Am I right? Yes. There's place that ways that we can uh, uh, move up. He said, you have a name to live. That is, you call yourself holy, but let us be reminded that holiness and kindness are not necessarily the same things. Holiness and morality are not the same things. Holiness will produce morality. Holiness will produce kindness. Holiness will produce brotherly love, but not vice versa necessarily. All right? So then in verse 2 he says, Be watchful and strengthen what you have left 
Strengthen those things that remain, those things that you have held to that are holy and righteous and, and uh, produces good conduct and make you a bright and shining light. Hold to that. He's not asking us to throw away the baby with the bathwater. He's telling us to be watchful and strengthen that which you have, that which God has given you, that are ready to die. There are people today, I don't know if there are any here, I'm not here to make that judgment, that are languishing. They're hurting. They want what they don't have, and they have maybe what they don't want or don't need, but they don't know where to look. They don't know where to turn. They don't know who to trust. This one said so-and-so, and they let me down. That one said something else, and it turned out to be totally different. And so he's saying, remember what you have received. Call to mind the things that were holy and righteous and just and hold to those things. Just because the environment has changed through the years doesn't mean that you are to let go of the things that you have received and just throw in the towel. That's not going to get us anywhere. That's not going to help us. So remember, so he said there's something from your past that is uh, worthy of remembrance. Amen. There was something that you have heard in the past that registered with your soul. You heard it. You accepted it. You obeyed it. You embraced it. Yes. But somewhere along the line, you have let some things slip. Right. Some things have gotten in the way, yeah. and you need to strengthen with whatever you have that's good. Strengthen that and reach out to God for more. Amen. The problems that we have in our day and age is that we are too busy yeah. with legitimate things. We are too busy. We are distracted. Well, I have to do this, and I have to do that, and I have this responsibility, and that responsibility, and it just seems that life's busyness has overtaken us with those legitimate responsibilities. And now I'm tired. Now it's late. I don't know if I can recover. I'm, I'm totally distracted. I can't focus. We're living in a generation of people who don't know how to focus. Their attention span is about eight seconds, and then they're moving and going to something else. And if we're not careful, the church of God will be in a mess. Actually, we are in a mess. Take that for what it's worth. So the question we would like to present to you today is what I put up here. Revival versus reformation. Do we need revival or do we need reformation? We're going to start with revival, okay? You pray now, the Lord will help us. The word revival comes from the word revive. And the word revive means to regain or restore to life or consciousness. It means to give new strength or energy to. It means to improve the position or condition of. Now, if we all be honest with our own souls, whether it be individually or collectively, I believe that we all can sense that there's been a pull and a tug at us to get tired and to let down. And we need some new strength. We need some new energy. We need, as it were, to be revived. Revival is not for everybody out there. Revival is for the church. Revival versus a resurrection. So resurrection is needed about the church, around the church, but the church needs a certain kind of jump start in this day and time if we'll be truthful with our own souls. So we need to improve our position in God. We need to regain something that seems to have been lost in some way or another. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 85. Psalm 85. I'm going to try to hurry as best I can, but please bear with me, because I'm not going to sit down until I'm finished, okay? So when God says it's enough, it's going to take me a while to get through where I want to go, so you just pray. It, Psalm 85, verse 1, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. 
Selah. Think of that. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. The key word in verse number six is revive us again. Again. We've been here before. Something happened. Some have a name to live, but they're barely hanging on. They're languishing, as it were. Now, Lord, we need to be revived again. It doesn't take us long to look around, and everywhere I go, everything, every place I think about, do call themselves Church of God, and I'm, I'm, I'm using Church of God beyond the borders of what you call Church of God, because this one calls itself Church of God, and that one, and that one, and that one over there, and somehow or another, we're not unified. We just might as well call it like it is. So he's saying, revive us, Again, in other words, give us another opportunity. Shake us up one more time. Stir our hearts and challenge our souls. Many congregations across the land and even overseas are shrinking. Why? Well, we, we claim we have this and we have that. Why aren't we growing? Why aren't we increasing? Why are so many people living under a, a cloud of discouragement? What is our problem? Lord, help us. Revive us again. Some, are, some congregations are dying out because of age. The, only, the, people, the people that are still a part of the congregation are getting older and older and dropping off the scene one by one, and we look behind, and who's there? We need revived again. The church of God is not meant to be uh, populated by old people alone. We need the old people. We need the middle-aged people. We need the young people. Revive us again because one day the old people aren't going to be here. I'm going I'm to ask, I'm gonna ask, please bear with me. Would all of those here today who are ministers of the gospel please stand? I want you to look at the population of our ministry. What do you see? You, <laughs> what? Okay, you may be seated. Just look around. Everybody that you see as a minister of the gospel that I look at, except one perhaps, is above 60 years of age. Pray for Brother Nathan. He needs some comrades. <laughs> he needs some encouragement. We need our old minister. I'm not berating any of them. We need all we can get. They come with wisdom. They come with knowledge. They come with experience. We can learn from them. But we don't want to stagnate and they die and there's nobody to replace them. Lord, revive us again. Where are those among the youth that are even thinking about aspiring for the ministry? Not me. Not me. No, I don't want that job because I know what this one went through and I know all the hardships that one went through. I know how that one was persecuted and I know how that one was sick and on and on and on it goes. So I'm going to protect myself. Uh -oh. I don't want to be a part of that. Lord, revive us again. Yes. Revive us again. What is happening as people are getting tired and people are battling all of what's on the outside, on their jobs, in their neighborhood, in their community, striving to raise their children right, and that's a battle, and that's a struggle, and they're dealing with peer pressure, and they're dealing with this, and they're dealing with that. And we come to church, and the services are predictable. What do you mean by that? We know who's going to pray. We know who's going to sing. We know who's going to testify, and we know who is not. services are exciting and unpredictable and got some life in them. Lord, revive us again. Send the power down. Help us to stop 
sitting on our lazy do nothing and get up and do something. Every single one of us that's professing salvation should have a testimony. And tell you the truth, those who aren't professing salvation also really have a testimony. It's just a different kind of testimony. A different kind. The preachers are getting old. The preachers are getting tired. And we need some reinforcements. We need some new blood. Thank you. And our parents are busy working to maintain a certain lifestyle. Working themselves to the bone. And the children, God help us, our children are missing, by and large, the training and the instruction that they need around the home fires because mama's gone, daddy's gone, and when they come in, they're too tired. They're too tired. So what do we do? How do we, how do we handle our children? God help us right through here. We entertain them. I'm tired. You know, here, take this iPad and go watch something. Go play your video games. Go, go do whatever you want to do. I'm tired. And so our children are being raised by social media. And how does that look like? How does that look? How does that look as they grow up? Where entertainment, where entertainment is their parent. You know, way, or either that or their peers. Back way, I'll say in the early 1900s, the culture was so, so different. The young people took their counsel from their elders. They had times that they sat down and they listened, and they listened to their parents and grandparents tell stories, share experiences, and model before them what they needed to become. Now, this many generations later, young people take their counsel from their peers. And that's dangerous. They take their call from their peers, and they're all lost. That and social media, and don't even bother to listen to the news because you don't know what's true from what's false. The sad part about all of this social media, your children have got, become addicted to that, and you have let it be so. And what adds to the problem is when we come to church, I can focus on the message if my child is over here playing games. And then when that child grows to an adult and goes to the world, oh, please pray for my children. You didn't do your part. You should have raised them by example, by teaching, by training, the Bible says train them up, teach them. The Bible says to beat them because they're not going to die. Uh, we don't mean to beat them and, and abuse them, but a good spanking will help. If I didn't get any, I wouldn't be here today. I'm telling you the truth. But those things help to keep children in line and teach them how to respect authority. Don't let your children speak back to you. Don't allow your children to boss you around. Our children are being entertained and occupied with electronics. And all too often, the adults sitting on the pew next to them are doing the same thing. I don't know how many times, all of us, all of us preachers and pastors, come to church, you have to tell the thing, please put it on mute, put it away, get it out of sight, but you know what? After a while, it's like falling on deaf ears. There was a time they'd try to hide it. They don't even bother now. They don't care if you see it or not because no matter what you say, they're going to do what they want to do. Lord, revive us again. Revive us again. Our children are very quick learners. Very quick learners. And they're very quick to learn that which will amuse them, that which will entertain them. And when that adrenaline rush comes, they want to go to the next level of whatever that game is. And many times it's a game about killing people. You know, I have a, a nemesis and, and he's trying to kill me and I'm trying to kill him. Don't you know that has a psychological effect on our children? 
Why would we allow them to play games that's teaching them to kill and conquer? Right. Right. Now we see it played out in real life. And what we're finding among our young people who are out there with AK rifles and AR rifles and whatever they're doing and going into schools and shooting folks, their mentality has been skewed. They don't value life. And, and the culture is being destroyed. We can't even go to the store in safety. And I just can't imagine me carrying a pistol everywhere I go. I just can't see that. But yet some people will, and it's proven to be a benefit, particularly in that last shooting that we heard wherever it was. Uh, in Texas, I think, wherever it was, in the mall, the food court, and a young man come in and he starts spraying, and another young man pulled his pistol out. Unfortunately, it killed him. But if he hadn't done it, many more people would have lost their lives. So we have the battle about the gun rights. Well, we're not going, to, going there. That's not part of this message. But our children are very quick to learn everything that's negative, everything that's ungodly, because they have a carnal nature. Yeah. Yeah. And you as a parent can feed that by giving them and putting before them the wrong things. I'm telling you, parents nowadays have a huge responsibility because our children are very quick I mean, they're much quicker than the adults to pick up on all that. And their, their attention span is drawn from here to here, and they can keep up with all of that until they get to the classroom. Then when they get to the classroom, they can't focus. Why? Because this is boring. When I was growing up, Lord help me, I'm taking too much time. When I was growing up, my mother taught us to love books. Bookmobile came, we'd take burlap bags full. And two weeks later, we'd have them all read, going back to the bookmobile to get some more during the summer months. During school, the bookmobile came to school, and we were allowed to check out so many books. We learned to love to read. If you have not learned to love to read, you are at a disadvantage when it comes to salvation. You are, dead, you are at a disadvantage. If you are a preacher and you don't like to study, you better pray hard for yourself. Because we need to get the word ingrained in us so we can in turn teach others and, and help to get it ingrained in them as well. Our children are living in a world of virtual reality. A make-believe world. It's not a real world. And therefore, when it comes to salvation, they don't even know how to process that. And we wonder why our children aren't getting saved. Because they don't really understand. Because we have educated them in the wrong things. We have educated them and allowed them to pick up on things that devalue the worth of humanity. Glorifies blood and gore. And the more bloody and the more gory it is, the better they like it. Right. Oh, it's sickening. Right. Right. There's a man named, or was, he's deceased now, named Neil Postman, who wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, the word amuse, picture it in your mind. A-M-U-S-E, amuse. The word muse means to think. The A in front of it means not. So this is what's happening. We are teaching our children not to think. They don't know how to think critically. We're teaching them to amuse themselves, and all too many adults are caught up in the same thing as well. They don't want to read a book. That's boring. Our children are so hyper. They don't know how to sit still. Everything is boring unless they're on the move, doing what they want to do. And I'm telling you what, their education is going to suffer, their adulthood is going to suffer, and things are going to be made more difficult for them until they learn some self-discipline, but it starts with the parents. And a lot of our young people these days are suffering from mental illness. Crime is getting out of hand among young people because they've been taught to devalue human life. And it starts with abortion and goes on beyond that. So what does a revival look like? 
Well, what a revival looks like now is not the same thing it looked like 50, 60, 80 years ago. Not at all. In our day and time, a revival looks like this. We're going to have maybe a three to five day meeting where uh, some special services, so maybe Wednesday to Sunday, maybe Friday to Sunday. We will call an evangelist in so they don't have to listen to the pastor preach. And he will come in and we'll invite, invite some family members perhaps, maybe some friends, the same people we've invited for the last six times we've had revivals. And uh, hope that somebody shows up for these revival services. Uh, we will practice ahead of time some revival songs so we can add some special singing to it. And we go through the same routine. Doesn't change much. Minimal change of our schedules. The preacher wears himself out or herself, as the case is, and maybe somebody will get saved. Just maybe. And now we can say we had revival. That's not what revival looks like to me in reality. So let's suppose that somebody does get saved. Now, the congregation is expecting one of two things. Either the pastor's going to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, or else they're going to grow up by themselves. We have no responsibility. Hands off. Hands off. When we need hands on. No follow-up calls. No checking to see how you're doing. Why? Because I'm busy. They got saved. They'll be all right. Is that how you grew up? Is that how you came along? Or did somebody take you under their wing and mentor you and work with you and have pain? Well, I don't have time and I don't have patience either. Well, you need to go back to the altar yourself then. Revive us again. <coughs> and we'll come around next year, maybe six months later, and we'll do it again. Do it again, and we've had revival. Yep. What does a real revival look like? First of all, revivals are birthed in prayer. Not just a casual prayer, Lord, you see we need a revival, and Lord, send us a revival. I would like, yeah, generalities. I would like to share with you. Please indulge me for a bit. I have uh, learned recently about the great revival in Wales back in the early 1900s. There was a young man named Reese Howell, and he was praying for revival. And according to what I understand, he prayed for 13 years before revival came. And when revival did come, that whole nation was lit up. 100,000 converts. And the people who worked in the mines, those old hard-hearted miners who were uh, like cursing sailors, it is said that the donkeys who, under the, who pulled the, the little rail cars that, uh, that carried the coal, no longer understood what their masters were saying to them. So they, were, they, they didn't know what to do because those people were not cursing anymore. The donkeys responded to curse words. And when curse words left, they didn't know how to get the coal out of there and the donkeys didn't know what to do. Now that's revival. That's real revival. Now the sad part of, a, of the whole thing, God worked 13 years of prayer. We barely spend 13 minutes and we're expecting something special. We got to do better than that. When we come even to the camp meeting, we had a prayer meeting, when was it? Yesterday morning. We had a nice group of people, but we're waiting and waiting. Who going to pray? Who going to pray? We had maybe three people pray when everybody should have been weeping before the porch and the altar, praying for revival right here. It's the same. It's no reflection of more on you than anybody else. We see it everywhere we go. The same few people will volunteer to pray, and everybody else has to be asked to pray. Prayer should be spontaneous. It should burst forth from a burden, from a concern. Lord, revive us again. Revive us again. We need God to help us. That Welsh revival only lasted for two years. Why? 
What happened? A hundred thousand converts, and it only lasted for two years? Well, I'm gonna share with you what I think the problem was, and is. There was nobody to mentor the new converts. It was said of them, if I can remember, the exa- I may not get the exact quotation, but it was said of them that there were more, baby- more babies were born than there were mothers to feed them. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. All of these spiritual babies were born, but, but there was nobody to feed them, no mothers to take them under their wing. And it could have been, you know, use that in a, a symbolical sense. They needed mentoring. Now look at Jesus when he started out. Now, what I'm sharing with you is not birthed by me. This is not anything that I thought up or, or whatever. Right. But Jesus started out with 12, 12 disciples. And he spent years with them, discipling them and getting them ready for his departure. He worked with them. He corrected them. He taught them. He rebuked them. He spent days and nights and weeks and months and years with those 12. And within the 12, he had a a tighter circle of three. When he left, he left them in charge, having mentored them, instructed them, taught them, rebuked them, whatever. And they carried it on and set the world on fire. What we need in our day and time is people who are willing to sacrifice their time, their energy, their abilities, and take somebody under their wing, as it were, and instruct them what you know. Well, I don't know how. Tell them your experiences. Share with them some of your battles, some of your struggles. Encourage them to hold on as you have held on. You don't have to be a rocket science. You don't have to be called to the ministry to be able to mentor somebody if you've got a clear testimony. Just make yourself available. Do you need a ride to church? And you can talk on your way to church and on your way home from church. There are so many ways if we really put our minds to it and allow ourselves to be revived again, God will help us. God will definitely help us. All right, now well, let's move on. Revival or Reformation? Let's go to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. <clears throat> Let's not be so quick to say they don't want salvation. People can, ha- can display a tough exterior and crying on the inside. If somebody would just break through this exterior, if somebody would just show me some kindness and, and, and help me, you know, I might be introverted and I don't know how to jumpstart the, con- the conversation or maybe I, I'm, I'm too shy or um, I'm embarrassed or, or whatever. Where is that one that can be quickened? Say, that person needs help. Go see what you can do to help them. God help us. Help me. Isaiah 43, we're going to begin reading from verse number. (coughs) Can somebody give me some water, please? Verse number 18. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Israel's history was dotted with success and failure. Captivity, Ultimately, ups and downs. They would get stirred and they would get challenged and, and uh, they would repent for all of whatever they got themselves into. God would come forth, give them a great deliverance, and as long as the older preachers and priests and whatever lived, they did well. But as soon as the old folk died off, they went on back to where they were before and even worse. So eventually, God sent them into captivity. And so they would repent and slide back. This is, not the, this is not the experience of a conquering Christian. Repent, slide back. Repent, slide back. At some point, you, it, that repentance needs to be ended, and you keep moving upward. 
and keep going forward. So as it were, at this stage, I believe Israel had been sold into captivity again. They were going to be there for 70 years. And here is Isaiah. There's probably more prophecies in Isaiah about the coming of Christ than any other prophet in the Old Testament. But here, God is telling them, I am going to do a new thing. I am going to do a new thing. And he did. Fast forward however many hundreds of years later, he sent Jesus. This thing in the Old Testament is not working. It's not, they're not going to ever change. It's going to be recycle, recycle, recycle. And for, uh, prophecy was fulfilled. Jesus came and he created a new order. Yes. A new order. Amen. And following that new order down through the centuries of time from over 2,000 years until now, there have been a series of reformations. There have been a series of revivals. And there have been... Unfortunately, more than one apostasy. It seems like we're going through the same thing over and over. Over again. So what do we need? Do we need a revival or do we need a reformation? I believe that we are at a time now when we need a new thing. Now what does that look like? Ask Jesus. It's too complicated for me. I don't know what it means. I just know that things are not working real well as we see them now. Too many people are saying, we're it. No, come to us. We've got the Holy Ghost cornered in our little group. And so let's, let's do, let's do. Just come here. No, they're, that, that's not them because. Uh, and it's not them either because. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, follow me, if you will, to the book of Ezra, chapter 3. And you might not agree with me today, but that's okay. Ezra, chapter 3. Now, here are the children of Israel, been in captivity again. The gates were burned, the walls were torn down, and... Um, they're trying to get themselves back together again, and Ezra's bringing back in waves, I guess, the people, etc. All right, I'm going to start reading at verse number 8. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests, and the Levites, and all that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. All right, so get the picture in your mind. It's time to rebuild the temple. And so God is using the prophets and the priests. God, they, they always have their place when they're faithful to their call. And then he's saying here, that the latter part of that verse, he said that of the Levites, that is those who are saved, those are, who are the servants, as it were, to the people, he said, from 20 years old and upward, they are to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. All right, so they did that. <clears throat> so they set about to reestablish and redo the foundation and build again. And when they finished the foundation, as we drop down to verse number 11, let's hear what takes place. And they sang together by course, in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Oh, look what we have done. Look what God has blessed us to get accomplished. We've got the foundation laid. Glory be to God. And they had a right to rejoice. They had a right to be thankful because they had been in captivation for so long and they missed what they had. <coughs> Verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. 
so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. All right, so we have two classes of people here. There are those who are shouting and praising God because the foundation has been laid. Now, let, don't be too quick to criticize. Because keep in mind, this had been in disarray for years. And some of the youth especially had never seen the house in its first glory. They didn't even know what the first house looked like. So they had a right to rejoice. God is doing a new thing. Now, it's understood that the replacement of the, the former Solomon's temple was going to be smaller. And as the old people looked at it and they looked back and said, Oh, I remember when this one got raised from the dead, and I remember when that one got uh, pulled out of the wheelchair, or God lifted them out of the wheelchair, and I remember when there were more people saved and we had mamas to feed them, and I remember this and I remember that, and this looks like nothing by comparison. Well, we need to take a look at that, I think. God chose those young Levites from the age of 20 and above to do the building. That was God's choice. Let us not disdain who God chooses. They did the best they knew how. They gave it all they had, and God honored it. Sometimes I think perhaps we do more damage in our criticism than if we just keep our mouths shut and let God have his way. We don't need anybody discouraging him and pushing down. Well, I hope brother so-and-so preaches because that other one we heard was boring. I hope this and I, well, if indeed that be true, who's going to take that person to the side and mentor them? Encourage them in their ministry and help them to grow rather than pushing them down. Who's going to lift them up? We need to reform our thinking. All right. The word reformation comes from the word reform. You know, back in the day, we sent our children that were incorrigible to reform school. They were supposed to be changed when, after they got finished there and made better. When it comes to the old people and the young people, Lord, help me right through here. Um, I think we need to reform our thinking. God is not necessarily going to do everything according to your paradigm. Perhaps your paradigm needs to change, and my paradigm, if I have one, also needs to change. We need to expand our thinking. Maybe God has a new thing for us to consider. God is not consulting with you nor me on how he should do this thing. And we would be foolish to try to figure it out. It's beyond us. But here I'd like to use an illustration if you'll allow me. I have concluded that there are too many people trying to corner the church of God. The body. I hear that word from time to time. If you're not with us, you're not with the body. All right, so here's the body. Now remember, we're the body. And we've got the Holy Ghost in there, and he's with us. He's going to do what we want him to do. And then we got another group over here. And they too are the body. They're just not as big. They're not as popular. But they got their lid on the Holy Ghost too. Let me tell you something. Please, in all humility. The Holy Ghost is not going to be controlled by you, nor you, nor you 
nor me. The Holy Ghost is his own. And he can do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it. And we will do ourselves a favor to back away and quit trying to control who can come in the church and who can't. It's in God's hands. Because if you're not careful and you get so exclusive, the Holy Ghost is going to burst out of there and you're going to be left by yourself. Then your religion becomes a form. Then it just becomes a list of rules. I am so tired of fences and walls dividing God's people. Now the old, the old people were unhappy. The young people were hungry. I am persuaded today that there are some people around. I may not know them, but I know that God's not dead and he's not deaf. And I believe that there's some dissatisfaction here and there and there and there. That people don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They need encouragement. They don't need any of us to press them down and to push them down. Too many fences are dividing God's people. You got to dress like us. You got to conduct your services like us. You can't do this. Oh, that's man rule. The real man rules when pastors overstep their bounds and take away our ability to think for ourselves. I can't imagine what I, some of the things I've heard through the years about pastoral authority. You can't go on vacation unless you tell the pastor where you're going and get his permission. That demonstrates a lack of trust in the pastor, I mean, in your, in your congregants. And if you can't trust your members, something's wrong with you, the leader. Traditions are being used as clubs. Certain doctrines, certain things in the scripture are called doctrine when in actuality they should not be called doctrine. Can I give an example? <clears throat> I'm going to quit here in a little bit. My voice will hold up. All right. Let's talk a little bit about divine healing. Divine healing is a tremendous blessing. God has healed. We know perhaps all of us have seen genuine miracles. And we have experienced personally healings that could not have happened if God hadn't done it. And I'll use myself as an example. When I left here last August, however many weeks it was after Vichy, and went home, I have struggled ever since with my health. I have prayed, I have sought God, I have gotten certain things examined, but I wouldn't, I'm not going to let man cut on me. By the grace of God, I'm not going to let man cut on me. I, wanna, I told somebody, a neighbor of mine, I said, I want to go to heaven with all the body parts God gave me. How he made me, that's how I want to leave here. Now, well, how am I going to be tested? Well, I've already been tested. But, and it might get worse before it gets better. I don't know. But let me just say this. Since I have gotten on the grounds at Vichy, I feel better than I felt in a long time. And I thank God for that. I came here with an expectation. And the Lord has helped me. Tremendously. And I'm thankful for that. So I'm not averse to divine healing. I was raised being taught to trust God for my body. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. But what I have a problem with is people imposing this as a doctrine. Doesn't matter anything else you do, but just don't take medicine. All right, there you go. That's right. So we got them all in a box here. We're going to trust God. What does it mean to trust God? Trusting God is not refraining from taking medicine. Trusting God is believing that he's going to take care of the problem. And what I have observed, and it's grievous to me, it's heartbreaking, and I believe that God is not pleased. And that is 
We've seen spousal abuse. We have seen temper tantrums. There's gossip, adultery even, stealing from the church, laying hands on people and watching them die. But when that one <coughs> who is guilty of all of those things, whoever he or she might have been, dies, they're sent straight to heaven. Oh, they trusted God all the way. Oh, they suffered. They say that's a re, that's a what do I call it? A reproach. That is a reproach. We do not want to discourage anybody from trusting God. In fact, we want to encourage you to trust the Lord. But we want to make sure that God gets the glory for what He does. But I will say this, I've never said this publicly, so I may be putting my head in the lion's mouth. I don't know. But I do not find in Scripture where divine healing has been, we have been instructed to teach it as a doctrine. You have to trust God or, or something's wrong with you. And we're expecting you to come up to that standard. And if you don't, we just leave you to die, and wherever you land, you land. The only thing I can read in Scripture as relates to healing in Jesus when he did it, when he walked on the shores of time, he just simply healed. He just did it. He, when that lady, let me use, I've used this as an example before, but when that woman with the issue of blood worked her way, scratching and scraping as it were, and, and barely able, because of the blood loss, uh, barely able to get to Jesus, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, that was a touch of faith. Yes, yes. And when she did so, that thing was healed immediately. Yes, yes. Now, why did Jesus not first turn around, or before she felt the touch, turn around and say, Lady, are you trusting man for this? Come on, come on. You've trusted man and taken all your medicine and spent all you had for how many years? Well, I'll tell you what, you throw all of that away, and I'll heal you. I don't read that. The fact that she was taking medicine did not prohibit her from getting her healing. Who am I then to tell anybody, and I'll tell you what, it could be criminal to tell somebody if their faith is not to that level, and you insist on them, they don't do it because they have faith, they do it because they fear who told them. Who instructed them? God does not get glory from that. And this is not about bringing glory to us. So there are those who would rather sacrifice their children on the altar of their church's doctrine than they would to give them liberty to do whatever their faith, however far their faith will carry them. If we as a ministry do not have the power to heal or to inspire faith, it is criminal of us to demand that you throw that medicine away and die if you have to. Not on my watch. Not, not me. I'm not going to take that responsibility. We need God's help. We need encouragement. Now way back, you know, we got this cookie cutter thing. We're going to go way back to the two centuries ago and we're going to try to cookie cutter what they did. What you cannot cookie cutter is the power of God. You cannot cookie, cookie cutter the gifts of God. That's got to be genuine, personal and up to date. We can't do that. So if I don't have it, I'm not going to force you to do something that might take you out of here. We could go on and on with C-section births. There are those who sacrificed their unborn child at the altar of their doctrine and went out into eternity. And there are others who chose a different route. And today, their offspring is saved, sanctified, working in the kingdom, which is better. Which is better. We don't want divine healing to become a legalistic something. 
Neither do we want to impose it as a doctrine. At least I'm not going to. It is a benefit. <coughs> it is an added blessing to salvation. Yes, yes. Psalm 103, help me say it. Um, my mind just went blank. Come on, help me with the first couple of verses. I will. Is that it? No, that's not it. Um, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who does what? Who healeth all thy diseases, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, and healeth all thy diseases. Blessing. And forget not all his benefits. It's a benefit. Now, God doesn't necessarily heal everybody in this life. And so people get this, this idea. I'm telling you, we need to change our paradigm. They, they think that, well, you know, trust God till you die, and if you don't get your healing here, you'll get it in the next world. That does not impress the world. That does not impress people that can't understand why you would let your child suffer till it dies or you would suffer yourself when help is available. Now, if you choose that, if that's your conviction, we'll do our best to stay with you to the last dying breath or until God raises you up. So I'm not encouraging not to trust God. That's not my point. I hope you can get that. That's not my intention. We want more faith. We're striving to get more faith. But we need the gifts. And who can God trust with them? You know what would happen? This group here. Now they claim the Holy Ghost is with them, but I'm not convinced. All right? So they're going to trust God till they die. They're going to trust God, trust God, trust God. And so what happens? They trust God. This one dies. That one goes to court. That one's ended up in jail. And on and on it goes. Is that attractive to the world? Does that encourage your faith? Does that encourage mine? Does it encourage mine? But it has happened and will probably continue to happen because people are stuck in the past. They are stuck with a men mental vision that they have of how it used to be. Now, if God were to heap on all these gifts, gifts of miracles, gifts of healing, gift of wisdom, gift of whatever, whatever, and then God began, remember this wall is still here. Yes. And then God would do what they wanted him to do. You know what's going to happen? Yeah. Come to us. We're in the church. Look what we did. I'm pretty much convinced this is why God's not doing it. Too many people want to take the glory to themselves. Well, they've got their file cabinet drawers full of what God did here and there, and, and they want to pull it back from 90 years ago right. and share what God did for us. Amen. You know what? This is not about us. Amen. This is not about us. So, do we need revival or we need, do we need reformation? I'm going to give you the answer momentarily. Another thing that has been a burden to me, I guess I'm unloading this morning. Is that okay? All of us are not at the same level when it comes to our faith. So don't try to force your convictions on somebody else. Don't try to make somebody have faith. Faith is not going to be, you can't make people have faith. You can encourage and you can help build up. You can share testimonies and you can offer inspiration. But if they don't have a mind to fight for it, Leave them in God's hands. Amen. Leave them in God's hands. Yeah. Now, here's another thing, and I shared this with the saints at home not very long ago, so those of you who are here, you're going to remember. We went through a little skit, as it were, of something that I had observed online of these so-called divine healing services. Here are people lying. I used to be, I used, when I used to go to certain camp meetings, we had it every year. There was one day set aside. We're going to have divine healing service today. It's a fast day. Kitchen's closed until supper time. And we're going to pray for the sick. So here we go. We go in and we pray, do so. And here's people lined up all the way across the front. All the way.
the way across the front. Now, back in those days, when I was young, we would pray for them individually. We would put that much in it at least. But now, what do I see? Somebody with the oil cup, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, anoint, 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 anoint. And when they get done, one person prays a general overall prayer. And everybody went out the same way they came in, except they got some oil on their forehead. That just really grieved my spirit. We need more than that. It just becomes a formality. It becomes a formality. We need God to help us. We need a change of the paradigm. They have become a mockery in my estimation. God is coming back for a bride that he can recognize as his own. It might not look like what you think everybody should look like. Those people who have gone way beyond the mark when it comes to how to dress, trying to mimic what happened in yesteryear, that does not bring the glory. That We're living in a totally different era and we make ourselves a spectacle to insist on certain styles of dress, and it becomes following man instead of following God in our consciences. There are those today who have become cults because the ministry demand and require certain things and take away their congregants' personal liberties. They don't even have a conscience anymore. The pastor and the other ministers and their apostles all their conscience it's a reproach and it makes it hard for the rest of us it makes it hard for the rest of us but I am convinced that there are some rumblings of dissatisfaction in all these groups the body I hear that so much we're the body and <laughs> And then these people got dissatisfied. They go over here and start making their own church. Now, we left them because, and now we're the body. And once again, brother, where's the, where's the head? Not any one of us can corner this thing. Not any group. I'm so sick of groupism. Lord, just tear down all those walls. And let me see the real church. Now, God's going to have one. Now, what he's going to do to make it happen, I don't know. But somehow or another, I'm hearing some rumblings of dissatisfaction from here and there and there. And that's a good thing. Because as long as we're complacent, nothing's going to change. We need to become dissatisfied. We need to start asking questions. And forget about those pastors that don't ask questions. You don't understand. Just obey your pastor. No, no, no. Have your own mind. Your pastor's not going to stand in judgment for you. You have to stand for yourself. So what do we need? Well, I'm going to tell you what we need. Revival or Reformation? Here's what we need. We need revival and we need reformation. We need to be stirred and, 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 and shaken up and revived and, and reclaim the things that we have allowed to slip. And then we need to start thinking differently. Just because God did thing, things a certain way in yesteryear doesn't mean he's obligated to do it again. Oh, but we have all these testimonies and how God did this and God did that and God blessed and God increased. Well, praise God, he did. But we're in a different era. We're dealing with different mentalities and God is going to do, I'm persuaded, a new thing. What it's going to look like, ask him. And, and, and do your part so that when he does it, you can recognize it for what it is right. and won't relegate it as another group. Right. I believe God's going to pull out from this group and that group and the other, and he's going to bring his people together in some kind of way, but he's got to have a ministry that won't take the glory, that won't say, oh, well, come to us. Well, here, you need to come to my congregation. Now, you go where God tells 
you to go. Where your soul can be fed. Where you can trust the ministry. Where, you know, people somehow think that going to a big congregation is where I need to be. Thank you, Sister Howard. I agree. No. Her congregation or their congregation is small and so is mine. But I'm not telling you to come to a small congregation either. I'm telling you to go where God says go. Amen. Where you won't be a burden to the pastor, where you can be an encouragement, where you can be a help, where you can be a blessing, and everybody can sharpen one another as iron sharpens yes. iron. Amen. Praise our God. That's the truth today. Do we need revival? Yes. yes Say it. Yes. Do we need reformation? Yes. We thought that the reformation of 1880 was the end of it. Oh, some thought Jesus was coming in 1880. Some thought he was coming in 2000 maybe. Why 2K? Uh, we don't know when he's coming. But the church is not ready for his coming. So may God help us to get busy, get dressed up, iron out the wrinkles, take out the spots, go before God, learn how to pray effectively more than five minutes at a time. You know, when I was coming out here a couple of days ago, I had such a good trip. I had lots of time to talk to the Lord, and it was a blessing. And maybe that's in part why I'm feeling so good. <laughs> I don't know, but I thank God for his blessing. Yeah. It was a good trip. Right. I dreaded that trip. I dreaded the traffic. I dreaded the distance. I dread. But you know what? I'm here, and I'm glad. Right. May the Lord bless you. Shall we stand? Yeah.